Hello, James. Thank you for coming. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> Batch. Um, so, how, what, what is it that you are about to do? I don't know. Like, you recently finished, you haven't finished uni yet, but you're about to finish. So, maybe, maybe you can start say telling something about studying with i don't know i wouldn't say you have disability or whatever what is it called dyslexia uh autistic processing problem Pro how, how how did you get diagnosed with it or like not diagnosed but how do you even find out that you have it um ironically i found we found out by mistake i was in year i was in i think year two and <laughs> The primary school that I was at at the time had absolutely no idea. They used to just give us give people like me who couldn't pay attention because of this form of dyslexia. They used to give us um, play there to sit and play with whilst they actually taught the class. Um, and then I moved to a better school, better school, and then all, immediately, immediately, the teachers were like, "No, he's got some. There's something there. Let's." get somebody in. So I got a professional in called um, Jean, Jean Stitt, I think it is. Um, came in in year three, did a test in year three, did a test in year five, came back that I had obviously processing problem. It basically means that verbally I can come across and sound extremely intelligent. So I know, you know, give me facts, figures, dates, I'm spot on with that at what you'd call kind of an A grade kind of thing. But when it comes to writing it down, I drop from that A grade down to about a C grade kind of thing. Because it's like the, um, whenever I think of an answer, by the time I'm going to write it down, I've forgotten it. Which means I've got to write really quickly, which is why often people who are diagnosed with having logistic processing usually tend to have very, very poor handwriting. Uh, going through... Um, into university and dealing with it in university. I'd yeah, so how from... do you study science <laughs> with that? With <laughs> <laughs> great difficulty. Um, <laughs> I don't know. It's, I guess it helps the fact that it's more computer-based. That helped quite a lot. And the fact that it's more intellectual-based, so it's more of the, you know, um, there, is a right, there, is a bit, there is a right and a wrong answer kind of thing. There, sorry, there isn't a right and wrong answer. With most science questions, it's more, how can you interpret this into the correct kind of thing? Um, and I dealt with it in what I thought was a reasonable manner, I guess. Um, you know this, you were there. Um, you were there. I used to go into the library late hours. I used to book this little, like, little suite kind of thing. It was one room was, not too big, not too small. And there'd be a big whiteboard there and a computer hooked up to a screen and everything else. And I would talk myself through it. So then I would be listening to myself over out loud, saying it as I'm saying it out loud, I'm writing it down. Or I'd have somebody in the room with me who I could bounce the ideas off. And that would often work very, very well. Me Often my, my best grades came from me focusing and being that particular format. Right, so for you to be able to remember what to write down, you have to say it out loud or to, like, to understand it, you have to say it out loud? To understand it, I've got to say it out loud and see it at the same time. So for me, the best way for me to understand it is I work on all three formats of the re receptors. So I'm, you know, I'm visual, I'm a visual learner as well as also a... Um, I'm not going to say the correct ones, but a visual learner, verbal as well. And then I'm the person who's a very much a tangible kind of person, person who likes to go and do it at the same time. That's how to cement things with me. And then to really round the job lot off, it works if I then teach somebody else. So that cements it for me as well. So doing that kind of aided. And then like when you learn, you remember it? Because like I know you're a genius with like history. Like... <laughs> I don't know how you know everything, pretty much, in history. It's a, it's a passion. It's a passion. The more I'm interested in something, the better my grade or the better my understanding is. As an example, ECG workings, working with the heart. I've always been, like I say, fascinated with the heart. I like that subject. I came out with a very, very good grade in that subject. Um, 
style of psychology. Now, I liked psychology, but the style of psychology that I was being taught in my second year, I didn't quite like. So okay. therefore, I did well on it. Um, the final one, you and me were in the same class for us, where they combined the two classes. I don't remember. <laughs> uh, the one that I fell asleep in. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, was we it like... What, what was it about? Uh, eyes. Oh. Yeah, yeah he was go. talking a lot about that. I think it was like the basics in psychology and he would talk about a lot, a lot about like perception and stuff like that. That was it. Perception and depth perception and everything else like that. I was not keen on that. I like your old Freudian kind of psychology, you know, more towards the literature side and the actual theorems. As well, that's my kind of area that I really like in psychology. When you start moving into depth perception and things like that, and you know, what do what what happens with the eye when you throw it, when you throw in a basketball or something like that, and that's not for me. I'm not. Oh, that. I so remember I the quiet eye. There you go, quiet eye. It was all to do with the basketball shot about whether. You, and I, I actually, ironically, I use that now whenever I play sport. And I'm using that. I actually use depth perception, so I remembered it. But I don't <laughs> like it. So now, if I'm ever playing golf or anything, I look at the ball, look at the hole, and look at the ball, and then I don't look at the hole again until I take my shot. <laughs> is uh, that, I do, is I that do. helping? Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> it should be. <laughs> Science says it should, but my skills are otherwise. I think you have to just use like deliberate practice and you use it like many times until you actually are good at it. I know I was yeah, doing the, the same in basketball, like when, when I would, and I, at the time, like I didn't know about this, but I know that I would never look at the, whatever it is, hoop, uh, when I'm shooting, like never, I would just focus on like, I don't know, my arms or the ball, but I would, I would look at the hoop, then I would dribble and then I would shoot, but I wouldn't look at it when I'm actually shooting, being like, is it going? <laughs> Uh, I used to do a lot of three pointers in basketball. So I used to always focus on depending on where I was playing back when I used to do basketball many, many years ago. I used to always look for the corner, the inside corner score, hit that depending on where I was. If you hit the up, if you hit the bang on the 90 degree angle, yeah. it's going in a lot near enough unless you spot so much power on it, it just rebounds out. But but yeah, that stuff could remember. But I think that's how I think that's how my dyslexia kind of, my dyslexia works. There's that many different types of dyslexia. It's unbelievable. Like, do you know any other types? Or like, how, what's the difference? God, yeah. I've got friends with uh, dyspraxia. Uh, dyspraxia is issues with balancing, percep uh, visual perceptions, things like that. Also playing into it can come into numbers, literature, uh, literacy, sorry, and various different forms of that. There's other forms of dyslexia as well. It covers... The, the term dyslexia covers a very large branch of, um, I want to say illnesses, but it's not really an illness. It's more of like just, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if I can pass it as a disability or not. I don't want to offend people. I don't know how I see yeah, it. Yeah, like I, I, I don't think it's a dis, well, I don't really like to call people that they have disability. I just, my English words are limited. So. <laughs> it's just a to the point where if we have to, if anybody, anybody who has dyslexia, they, they gain extra time on examination. So therefore it can be classed that way as a disability. Um, we have there's tons of different ones. I know people who have to use a different color coded um, sheet. So if they're reading something, they have to put a uh, clear, a clear piece of like um, see-through cardboard or something like that. I don't know what it's called. Yeah. Over the, well, it's like a divider divider over the top so they can read correct so they can read it read with the um, work and things like that and people have to write in special pens as well wow. there's all sorts of different things it covers quite a large area but i'm obviously not very very clued up on it before. yeah well you know enough about yourself so <laughs> well, well, well yes well i never really diverged into the whole dyslexia kind of thing it's not something i was Reminding, reminded of having on a regular basis. So, so like how? Well, how do you even? I don't know. I'm, I'm just curious. And what's the, what's the process? So, like when you're learning, is it only that you have to use like pretty much all senses, or have to hear it out loud that you say it to yourself, or somebody else says it to you? 
I think it varies from person to person, but for myself, using lectures, lectures as an example, I couldn't sit in lectures for an hour, hear people talk. I couldn't, I just could not do it. I couldn't keep up with the writing of it. I couldn't stay concentrated. And it's not for me going on my phone or wanting to be elsewhere. It's just I try and I try and try and still not be able to do it. However, though, I had very good friends at university who would come, who would be in the same lecture as me, and then we'd go after lecture elsewhere, and they would tell me in layman's terms, they'd tell me exactly what's been said, short, they'd take out all the nonsense and everything, and they'd tell me in short exactly what was said. And from there, because I was, I, it's like, um, it's like not peer assessing, but it's like having one of your peers tell you it makes it sound a lot easier to understand. Yeah. But I'd understand it. And then we'd go over we'd go over it and I'd make it look different colour with different colours and everything else. Make it look bright, make it look like I want to look at it. Because someone like me looking at, you know, a load of literature just writing down black and white, it's I already I I get half a sentence and I'm like, okay, this is boring, what's the alternative? But if it's in different colours related to different parts of the topics, I'm interested which helps with the cognitive responses. So how do you write that essays? <laughs> um, here's one which a lot of people <laughs> will laugh at. I write essays with heavy metal music <laughs> in my ears. So I have one of my favourite bands, and that's how I did my dissertation, most of it. I have headphones on, and I find that that just eliminates any on all distraction. And surprisingly, even though I've got heavy music on, I think a lot better for some reason. It's really, really weird. I come up with some of my best things when I'm listening to really, really heavy, heavy music. And I don't know, time just seems to pass. It seems to fly. You know, I could be sat here and trying to do an essay and get through a paragraph in four hours. One paragraph in four hours. But if I add the music... I can get to that one paragraph in about half an hour and it'd still be to the same, if not better, standard. Wow. Kind of things. <laughs> I, I have no idea. But that's I how remember, I do it. That's what I, I do. remember one time, I think you said it in library. And I was like, how? Because for me, that's when I wouldn't be able to focus. I would be getting distracted. But for you, it's actually helping to focus. Surprisingly, yeah. I Like I say, I'm a real oddball. I'm real oddball. Okay, so another thing is about sports. How you, I don't know, you have done so many sports. How do you even <laughs> do so many? Like, <laughs> um, Well, I learned from a very, very young age. I was, I'd like to say I was lent towards sports rather than pushed. But pushed might be underestimating it, undervaluing it a little bit. <laughs> placed in sport. I was placed in sport. From a very, very young age, I knew where, where I would end up. I knew sport was a thing for me. From about the age of four, I started training. My father started training me. He used to train myself and my brother. We used to have bunk beds. I, know, you know, with that, I was that kid who, at the age of like eight, had a six-pack. Because... You know, we were doing pull-ups, we were doing crunches, press-ups. I was doing press-ups on my knuckles, which now that I studied sport, I know it's extremely bad for you. But I was doing all this thing all the way about maybe four or five years old, all the way up, all the way up until I still do it now. You know, I started playing football at about the age of four as well. And I played football all the way through until about 16, something like that, when I, when I decided I wanted to play more contact sports. So... I don't know, I was really, really pushed into it. And it's obviously it's having, you know, having the fact that I come from parents who were sporty. Well, one of my parents was extremely sporty with my father, obviously, racing for Team GB and obviously being an Olympian and the rest on all that. And my mother, obviously, being a figure skater. You know, it you know, pushes you in that kind of direction. It kind of, you know, they give you a helping hand of going, here's what you're good at, go do it. Kind of but it wasn't like, let's say, did you ever feel like you don't want to do it? 
No, I, I can honestly say, no, I never, ever thought, I don't want to do this. I used to do, um, look forward to sport. Sport was a get out of it all for me. It was a way of like, it was a way of taking the weight off, way of relaxing. You know, for me, going and playing a very competitive game of football, a uh, competitive sport, whether, whether it was a singles, singles kind of thing where I was running individual sport, whether it was team sport like likes of football rugby just a way to relax I get stressed through the game of course I'm extremely competitive but I don't know it felt good at the end of it I always felt good even if I'd come away from an injury it just felt good and obviously winning would feel even better I don't know it just felt really really good and I really felt like I'd accomplished something right so that relaxing part how is <laughs> can you explain how training or like competing is like relaxing for you because I think for many people that's like the opposite it's relaxing well I don't know it's I just feel like I'm in my own little world kind of thing when I whenever I'm you know competing even now when I'm at the level which I'm at in competing whether I'm in the gym trying to get a PB whether I'm doing um, an actual stage you know kind of thing It's, it's relaxing. The build up, don't get me wrong, the build up is stressful, extremely stressful. But once you actually start, you know, once you hit, once you hear that gun sound blast and the race is underway, it's nothing. You're just relaxing, you're giving absolutely everything you possibly can, but you don't have time to worry, you don't have time to stress. You can't waste that energy. You've got to put it into every single stroke that you're doing. And for me, that's relaxing. I'm expelling every bit of steam that I've you know, built up, you know, every little bit of anger that I've had it all, you know, anything that's gone wrong. I'm expelling it there in a nice, healthy way. I'm expelling it in every paddle stroke. Like, is it that you are in the flow as you perform? Yeah, I'm in a complete world of my own when I have right form completely twirled by him. So how do you get in that like flow state? Um <laughs> I thought this would come up. <laughs> so I have to put this one out there. I do not recommend this in slightest to anybody but the way which I personally get into my own flow is I listen to quite dark music. So I listen to music which Mm, doesn't put you down but kind of bigs you up in the sense of the artist is telling a story and it's a negative story but it's saying how they're using that experience then push them forward I utilize that and I often will drift away with that and then put myself into you know any bad situation that I've ever been in I will think of the worst thing I could possibly think of that's ever happened in my life allow the everything to build build and build and build and this is seconds this is seconds minutes before i'm racing kind of thing this is the real build up kind of thing for it and then as soon as i hear the go sign or i'm about to pull my a pb attempt i release it and all of that stress that anger all that comes out into whatever it is that i'm doing so if i'm doing a pb pull then it's coming out during that deadlift during that bench press If it's, you know, whilst I'm racing, then it's coming out in them first few strokes. Every single thing I've got is in them few strokes kind of thing. That's me releasing all that energy. And it's that anger that drives you going forward through it. And then afterwards, obviously, I release, release it and go back to being me. But so how, how do you turn it off? Because I think, or I don't know, even like whether you control it as you perform like is is there like a off switch <laughs> <laughs> there's a there's a fail i believe there's a fail safe i've never had to use it but i believe there's a fail safe with it um switching it off is i after a race i need about two two three minutes five minutes to myself just to really bring myself back around, you know, see that heart rate's dropping, my breathing's coming back to being normal. And all of a sudden, it's, I can evaluate what's just happened. You know, we've just gone out there, we've just done this race, we've done this, okay, start releasing it all, start releasing it all, and 
then it's fine. Then I'm back to being normal. And the process starts again when it comes to the next race and so on and so forth. Have you used it anywhere else but sports? No. And I never will. Ever. Just for fear. For blatant fear of, you know, horror. <laughs> Wait, so... So you use, you use it only in sports. Is it like sports specific or it's like some sort of coping mechanism? Or like maybe uh, how did you create it? Was it for sports or like it just somehow naturally got born? Yeah, it did by accident. By accident. I can't actually remember the process. I remember the very, very first time I experienced it and I believe it was in a game of rugby. And... I was playing again at quite quite a very very high level, and so I was actually representing the north of Eng- north of England and the colleges um, for Cra- uh, for Craven College. And I think oh that was it. I'd missed a tackle in a rugby game, and we were playing at home against a team which we really hated. I believe it was Myersco or Hartlepool or something like one of them two, and. I got injured and screwed my leg badly. When I said screw my leg badly, I mean I was hobbling kind of thing. I came off, came off, couldn't walk. And the person who'd done it, who was near me, who was involved in it, was laughing at me, telling me, saying, "Go on, number fifteen, stay off." Because I was I was fullback at the time. Go on, number fifteen, you stay, stay off, stay off. And that enraged me. And that's when the adrenaline kicked in. So normally speaking from a you know, physiotherapist side, you know, you've come off injured. The nine times out of ten, you're staying off for the rest of the game because otherwise you're going to do more damage than good. But it enraged me. It really enraged me. And I immediately got up and started limping up and down, up and down the on the sidelines, limping up and down. Then I started walking up and down. Started a real a weird hobbly jog kind of thing, which then turned into a full jog back up and down. Then I tried a little hobbly kind of sprinting up and down. And within about 10 minutes, I came back on. 10 minutes, I came straight back on. And within the very, very first move we did, I got played the ball, cut the line, and went straight through and did a full length and scored. Towards the end, my leg went fully completely. So I was kind of hopping towards the end of the line kind of thing. But I'd else passed everybody in the, on the pitch, scored. And then I came off the pitch. Do you feel pain as you do it? Like, was pain because I I know that it's possible to block the pain out somehow. Um, but like, how do you feel pain as you are in that state, or it's just doesn't it feel that there? It helps. I thrive off of it. Okay, so that is my next question. It's like, how do you deal with people doubting you or maybe not believing in you? Oh God, that's yeah. I love that. I really love it. I love to hate it. Uh, there's a, a quote. I will be that person. I will be that guy. I will quote a lyric from Eminem saying, because it feeds me the fuel that I need for the fire to burn. And he's, he's talking about doubters, people doubting him, doubting the way he can come from, because of where he comes from and how he can go forward. And it says that, you know, it feeds him its fuel. It, it gives him fuel to burn his fire, his fire of desire. It burns him. That's what I use. That's how the anger comes into it. That's also imagine. Imagine there's a big furnace inside me. Every negative bit of comment that's come this way saying you can't, you can't, you can't. There's just a miniature me shoveling that stuff into this fu- into this fire, and it's just fueling me. It's making me go and go and go. I'm the kind of person where if I'm losing at something, yes, I get annoyed, but I can accept it. But if I'm losing in something and then you bloat before it's over, I somehow find another gear and I go again and I come back and I come back as hard as I can. And I don't personally understand it too much. All I know is I just can't take losing. That's one of the things. I'm very, very competitive. And like I say, I'm used to the negativity. So I've so as a way of... How do you kind get of... used to negativity? <laughs> um be surrounded with it my entire life realistically um it started in home i've had it at home for as long as i can remember um i had it at school from year three all the way through being ginger 
<laughs> being ginger and being dyslexic in an English school is a death sentence. But I think you also it's said that up. it was because you were like really good at sports or like you were the best. That's well. part of it, yeah. In primary school, that was a massive kill. I moved primary schools to a Catholic school and I went there and there was a friendship group of about seven lads or something like that. And for most team sports, you require seven people. So they, they, they must have, through year one, year sports teams, they must have all got through a friendship group. You know, they beat everybody else. And all, so, all of a sudden, I turn up this random kid. I just happen to be good at sport and very competitive. And all of a sudden, I'm getting picked over their friends. So their friends are missing out on these days out, these days off and all the rest of it. And they're having to be with me and they're not liking it or I'm going for a position that they won or something like that. And it bred this hatred towards me that, you know, we ended up at the school I was at, it was very, very sporty, very, very competitive for sport. And I thrived in that environment. Obviously, the negativity that came from them towards me, the bullying that came, the isolation from them and all the rest of it, that, that followed suit and I just added to it. But I was the kind of kid that, you know, you threw a sport at me, like, I'll just go. You know, I'm a guy. Do you want to do gymnastics? Sure, why not? You're a, I'm a guy. Do you want to do cheerleading? Hey, I mean, primary school, go for it. I did every sport I got, that I got offered on a plate to me. And anyone that I got offered, I went for it. I trialed. And it's just Sud's law that every time I went for one, I got in. And every time I got in, somebody out of that friendship group lost their place, which meant they all disliked me. I was effectively breaking up their friendship group. And yeah, that stemmed all the way through from year three to year six, which was quite fun. It's so with the... Well, I think what you're saying is the more people hate you, the better you get. I'd say that to a degree. Um, how, how does that work? Because I think it's like the opposite <laughs> to what many people have. Um, I don't know. I don't know. It's again, it's just that desire again to prove people wrong as well. It's that desire to prove people wrong, the desire to be the, be the best. You know, to perform at the level that you know performing at that I currently do perform at. Like, you've got to have. You can't go in. At, you can't go in at half. You, know, you can't do that you've got to be in all in you know because otherwise you're going to look silly you know? that's, yeah, that's the kind of thing you've got to do so I utilise everything that I can get to get an advantage so I use all the negativity that I've had as an advantage all the people that I dislike dislike me it's more of a case of okay fair enough I've not done anything to you but, I've, but somehow magic somehow I've upset you and that now you dislike me, fair enough. I'm now going to prove to you that I'm better as an ally than as an enemy by going out there and winning anything that you're going for, anything. So, because often we have people from the same, we all from the same leagues. It's more of a case of well, I'm gonna, I'll go win this. And it sounds petty, but that's been seen on so many different stages as well. My club, we do the same. I've done the same with that one as well. But so how do you... I think naturally people want to be liked. How do you deal with people not even that like you, even like to the level that they hate you? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's ways to take it. I mean, I only have that in a sporting environment. I don't get it on a day-to-day -day basis. So at work, I'm not hated. In my relationship, I'm, I'm assuming I'm not hated. <laughs> my voice is something different. Um, my friendship group, I'm not hated. And you know, I'm, I'm loved, I'm respected. It's the sporting world. And the sporting world is so full of politics, so full of, you know, if someone's better than you, then naturally they hate you kind of thing for it. If someone's got something you don't have, you naturally want it. It's kind of a human instinct and it becomes more profound in sport because you know sport adrenaline's going you know hormones are flying all over the place everybody just kind of like lets loose everybody's after one thing but only one team or one person can take that thing so obviously it spouts envy from envy comes jealousy from jealousy comes hatred so it's kind of like a little 
Chai, got like I think just in, in life in general, when it comes to success, I think in any area, like not everybody can win. So it's, it's, it's kind of the same um, because I know that even myself, I have learned, I don't even think I would be the person I am if there wasn't sports in my life, because there's so many things you learn as a person, even like the simple thing is discipline that like you can't win on like day one of training. It's just like not possible. <laughs> Someone forgot to give me that memo. What? Unfortunately. Someone forgot to give me that memo. That I cannot win on day one of training in my head. Train uh, uh, even on day one of a brand new spot, I still try and win absolutely any and everything I go go for. It's that mindset. And so how do you develop the mindset of going like all in? Um as Harsh as it sounds, I talk myself down in my head. So I'm negative to myself in my head, which again fuels me. So as an example, obviously I nearly unfortunately died in first year of university um, due to liver, kidney and liver failure due to excess training. During that training session, it hurt. It really, really hurt that training session. Then that full weekend really hurt. But every time I was feeling down, all I kept saying in my head was, and I know it sounds cliche, I know it sounds like I'm bigging myself up or anything else. All I kept saying was, you know, you're the second generation, second generation of Team GB. Your father was this. This is what's expected of you. You, know, you have to go through this pain. This is you paying your dues. You go through, you go through this pain, and you come out the other side. You come out a winner. You know you're proving to these coaches why you deserve to have a solidified position in Team GB. Why you're the first. You should be one of the first people that they phone up and say, "Hey, congratulations, you've made it." You know you're fighting for that, and that's what I constantly would tell myself through these training sessions. Obviously, that's why I ended up putting myself, myself in hospital due to the tra- due to, you know, overcome over really going overboard with the training. I ended up doing the training session that they wanted four times over, straight after each other, without water, which was why the lactic acid in my bloodstream was like vinegar. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's that kind of desire. It's, I wouldn't say it's discipline. I'd say it's a lack of discipline. In what way? In the fact that people who are disciplined, they know their limits. They reach their limit and their body's like, you've reached your limit. And their head goes, you know what? I agree. This is our limit. My body goes, this is your limit. That's it. You can't go past it to my brain. goes, eh, let's try a little bit more. Like, right, okay, you're really pushing it now. My brain's like, let's give it a bit more. And then my body's like, okay, you're really hurting me now. And my brain's like, let's do one more round of this <laughs> thing. And, you know, it's that kind of you know, balance. And Wait, like, is it is it a discipline to learn to stop when your body's saying you to stop? Yeah. Or like it's if it's lot. too far, because I think as an athlete, you still have to be pushing yourself, but not too far where you're actually like, your body is starting to break down. Well, my body... My body's used to taking quite a large amount of punishment. I'm used to physical punishment. I play, like I say, I play rugby at a very, very high level. I'm used to getting clattered. I'm not the biggest you know, rugby player person on the planet, so I get, got creamed quite a lot in rugby. So I'm used to the punishment. It was always a case of, ah, I've dealt with this kind of punishment before. Keep going, kind of thing. It's a case of, you know, I'm going to start small. Like when I first started, I first started, you know, racing at the competitive level not long ago. I got, I did one national event, one national event, and then got picked up by Team GB. And it was within a few weeks of that, I was at a training camp for GB. And it was a case of, I'm an unheard of name, never raced for Team GB in this section before. They don't know who I am. All they know is I play rugby. I'm like, okay, let's go make my name. Now, this is a clean canvas. And on that canvas, I want to say patch. That's what I want in large letters. Patch. That's what I want right at the top. So I was, you know, I scoped out the competition. People who would be my teammates in race days 
I saw them as competition. They're my competition. My benchmark is that is the very best paddle in this boat. That's my benchmark. Yeah. I reach that benchmark, I go higher. And as a result, it hopefully it make my team go higher. 